Hi everyone, my name is Robert J. Schwalb, and my friends over at Weird uh, have asked me to spend some time talking about Shadow the Demon Lord and what went into the process and all that good stuff. And uh, so, uh, as, as you might have gotten from the introduction, I did create Shadow the Demon Lord, and I did that after I wrapped up my work on 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons. Uh, for a number of years prior to running my own company, I was a contract designer for Wizards of the Coast. Uh, I worked previously on... Uh, Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay as a line developer. I, I also helped and has actually designed a Song of Ice and Fire role-playing and a variety of other supplements for Dungeons and & Dragons and other D20 spin-off games and so on and so forth. Uh, but Shadow of the Demon Lord was uh, kind of came to, it's been something I've been working on for a number of years uh, and it's not that I had a really concrete idea about what I wanted to do to start but rather it was uh, kind of the my reflections and reactions to role-playing games over the years uh, as a fan and also as a designer in the in the business. And when I wrapped up my work on D&D, &D, uh, I was kind of faced with a choice. I could go back into the freelance pool or I could uh, start my own company and do my own thing. Uh, obviously, I chose the latter, although I still do some freelancing on the side, but uh, that's not what we're here to talk about. Um, so what I did with Demon Lord, what I, what I had some basic aims. One, I wanted a game that would be uh, enjoyable and by veterans and novices alike. I wanted to be familiar enough to gamers of all stripes that you can easily move in and pick it up and play. And I wanted to get uh, to the heart of what makes role-playing games really exciting. Uh, when the stakes are at the highest, when uh, the tension is really, is really strong and severe, and when... Uh, you know, you're telling interesting stories to your friends. And so what I, so those kind of objectives, uh, and they're broad, of course, um, guided a lot of the design that went into the game. Um, largely, uh, you know, so that's why we use a D20 instead of using some other dice mechanic, uh, because it's familiar. Everybody who plays role-playing games knows uh, what a D20 is. And, but by restricting the number of the, the uh, range of dice using D6s and D20s, means that, you, that it's really easy for novice players to kind of jump in and get involved without having to kind of figure out which one's a D8, which one's a D10. Um, the other thing I also wanted to do with this game was I wanted to allow people to kind of let their characters evolve with the story. Uh, so rather than lock you into one particular uh, class or profession or archetype, uh, we allow characters to evolve, or rather characters make big, uh, players make big decision points about their characters as a campaign progresses. So you might start off as a, just a human farmer in the very first game and then find out that you're really good at fighting people and then become a warrior and then only to find out later on that you have a knack for magic and then become a wizard and then find out that uh, some sort of horrible circumstance happened in the campaign and your character is going to go on a murder spree and becomes a death dealer at the end. And that's just as viable of a choice as somebody who starts off being, I want to be a magician and then a wizard and then a pyromancer. Uh, so it's... We, by allowing these big, uh, juicy, chunky mechanical options uh, for your path, op your path choices, allows you to kind of build a character you want to play in reaction to what's going on in the unfolding story. Um, some other things I, I did with this too was, uh, well, actually, another side, let me back up. One of the benefits of this means is that complexity grows as you play. So a novice player who's never played a role-playing game before has to only really kind of learn how the basic game works at the start. And then as that player continues to invest in the game and play, uh, he or she will gain newer and cooler mechanics to use and exceptions to the, to the core rule set. So that by the time that they've wrapped up the campaign, they've got a bunch of moving pieces, but they, know they have mastery of them all. Um, we did some other, to, not to drill down too deeply into the, uh, into, the, in, into the guts of this game. Some of the things we did was we removed any notion of initiative system. Uh, characters just go first unless something weird happens. Uh, what that allows uh, players to do is allows them to just, we don't have to, you can move more easily from the narrative to the tactical style of play without having to worry about some sort of mechanical hoop that you have to jump through in order to transition into the new phase of gaming. Uh, the other thing we, we do with this too is that uh, allows players to work together and to encourages teamwork and cooperation when they're in a fight so they can talk to each other and figure out what, what their, what their uh, plan is going to be to deal with whatever opposition they might be up against. Um, and then there, there are other things that go with this game as well. Uh, we scooped up all the, bon all, the, all the bonuses that might live in another role-playing game. 
uh, into what we call boons and banes, and they make uh, tasks easier or harder by adding to your d20 roll or subtracting from your d20 roll. And there are a variety of other things in the game as well that kind of streamlines the role-playing experience and keeps it fun and engaging while still giving you a sense that you're making really meaningful choices both in play and then also out of play when you're moving your character up uh, to the next the next stage. So um, I kind of answered both questions. The second question, which was, which are, in your opinion, the more innovative ideas and the ones you're most proud of? Um, and that's kind of what I was talking about there as far as what I was doing with the game and the mechanics. Um, and I really, but I want to take a sidestep and kind of talk about the the setting. One of the promises that a lot of big box sandbox role playing games make is that you're going to have a 20, 30, 40 level experience where you're going to start off as some you know minor farmer character or uh, you know town hero, and then you're going to work your way up to become the king of the world. Um, the problem is is that. Uh, Based on data we, when I was on, when I was working on D and D, based on data we, we received from uh, from the customers, was that a lot of campaigns break down after two, maybe even three months, which means that at most you're going to get two to maybe twelve sessions of gaming in before your campaign completely falls apart and you have to start over. What that and what that tells us is that the top half of the game, or really the the latter, the, the end game stage, is almost never realized because players never get there unless you start your game at a higher level or with more experienced characters, whichever game system you're using. Um, so what I wanted to do was take all the cool stuff that ends up being the, the final stage of the campaign, the, the, uh, where the big demon lord is crawling out of the abyss and into the world, or where Asmodeus leads the legions of hell to, to besiege the gates of heaven, or the uh, dead planet is moving into, or it is now orbiting your campaign world and it's causing the undead to rise, or whatever you want to do. The, the big Godzilla-like monster crawls out of the ocean, starts stomping around the countryside. Those are the things that you would be call your end, your end game, your end set piece. And those are the things that, uh, that we have, as game dungeon masters or game masters, we have this vision of how we want our campaigns to end, but we almost never realize that. So what Shadow of the Demon Lord does, it grabs that end piece and then yanks it forward. So that means that you're playing in the end times or in the conclusion of what would be in another fantasy role-playing game's uh, conclusion. And that makes it, and that puts it in the backdrop so that your uh, game then, is, then the stakes are right there in front of you. So you're, you're rapidly fighting uh, cultists and demons and beastmen and other monstrosities and solving mysteries and tracking down weird relics that have incredible power, uh, resisting the temptation to grapple with dark magic before it corrupts your soul, because otherwise if you do, it might corrupt your soul, and all those other cool things. And then you come to the end, when the world's going to really die, and you might have a shot at stopping it from happening. Um, to kind of build onto that idea is that we have uh, these things called Shadows of the Demon Lord. And a shadow is a, is a skin you place over your campaign. Uh, we talk about it a little bit in the core rulebook, but we also um, we go into deep detail in the Hunger and the Void accessory. And what these do is that they're, they're, they're like campaign overlays. Um, so you might have one overlay that says uh, you're in the middle of a zombie apocalypse. Or there might be the demonic incursion where holes to the void are starting to appear and demons are spilling out. Or where everyone's going crazy. Uh, and man, or nature is completely out of control, and so plants are growing to absurd size, and, and all those other create all that fun stuff that would make your campaign setting uh, feel like it's imperiled. And uh, you can change these during the campaign. The characters might be able to head off one shadow of the demon lord, only to find a second shadow that's coming on. And those are the kind of things that kind of cook to make the game really distinct and and, and unique. Um, so that's pretty much the nuts and bolts of what Shadow of the Demon Lord's about. Uh, I know Weird, my friends at Weird are running a Kickstarter for the game, for the Italian edition. The box set looks awesome. It's going to be loaded with content. Uh, and they're unlocking stretch goals after stretch goals. So there's going to be more stuff coming out. And Schwab Entertainment, my company, has almost 150 products, including card sets, all in the works, or all out or in the works. So there's plenty of support for this game. Um, and the last thing I want to say is, uh, well, th there are two things I want to say. If you have backed the campaign, thank you very much. And you, I think you're going to be, I know you're going to be excited once you get the product in your hands. And 
Uh, and I hope that I hope to hear about all the fantastic games and horrific experiences you've had playing uh, characters and running games, fighting against the Demon Lord itself. And uh, I'd like to invite all of you to come to Luca Games uh, Comics and Games uh, in a few. I guess it's just about six, eight weeks. Um, I'm going to be there, and I can talk to you in more detail about the game and even run a game for you. So I hope you're there, and uh, thanks so much. Have a great rest of the day, and uh, hail the Demon Lord.